So one of the great perks of this job is I get to introduce Stuart Butler. So Stuart uh, has actually been be here before, and he's one of those guys that I was, you know, kind of taking notes in the audience that my head snapped up, and I thought, I, I, it has dawned on me that this man actually has forgotten more about healthcare policy than I will ever know. Um, and so it is uh, really a privilege, basically, for me to, uh, to do Stuart's introduction this morning. Stuart Butler is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, and prior to that, he spent 35 years at the Heritage Foundation as its director for Center for Policy Innovation, and earlier as a vice president for domestic and economic policy. He teaches at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy and is a visiting fellow for the Convergence Center for Policy Resol uh, Resolution. Uh, he is on the editorial board of Alan Weil's publication, Health Affairs. But potentially for this audience, the most uh, uh, notable uh, accomplishment is that Stewart participated in the very first symposium debate and his team actually won by changing the most uh, audience minds. It is a great pleasure this morning for me to introduce Stuart but Butler. Please help me welcome him to the podium. Well, thanks uh, very much, Jay. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back uh, here. I did indeed have a debate with T.R. Reid uh, a few years ago. And uh, those of you who know him would know that that was quite a uh, challenging exercise uh, to be involved in. Um, I, I should make a few things uh, clear, first of all. One is that, uh, uh, in case you didn't realize, I'm not from Colorado Springs. I'm from the UK originally. Uh, and so I have experiences in, in some very different health systems. Uh, than here. Uh, the other thing I should just emphasize, uh, uh, Jay said, uh, introduced me as Dr. Butler, um, I actually have a PhD, not an MD. And uh, some years ago, uh, my younger daughter said to me when I was about to go and give a speech, um, if they ever introduce you as Dr. Butler, uh, make sure you tell them that uh, you're the kind of doctor who can't actually help anybody. Um, <laughs> so I've always been cognizant of that uh, in terms of thinking about what I can do to help. Uh, I should also, just to add to the, uh, uh, the challenges I face, you know, I'm from Washington, I'm here to help you, uh, that, that I've spent uh, 40 years uh, really working in, in Washington, uh, dealing with public policy issues, not just in healthcare, uh, but in a lot of other areas, uh, social welfare, housing, uh, urban policy, and, and so on. Uh, and so I've tried to kind of look at at this whole picture of what's going on in the, in the US with regard to healthcare in that light, looking at these very different uh, areas. And Jay, uh, I think, very nicely laid out a lot of the issues that I've been thinking about uh, over many years, um, the relationship between healthcare and other factors for people, uh, where they're brought up, uh, how they're brought up, uh, what their income is, uh, and so on. And we're learning, of course, more and more, as he said, that health is really connected to a lot of these other issues in very profound ways. And we're learning more and more about the way uh, in which this happens. That where you are brought up, the housing that you are in, the kind of education you have, very much affects uh, the health care you have. And vice versa. Uh, if you want to look at, at uh, kids who succeed in school and go on and are successful uh, in later life, uh, health care and their health condition is very, very important. So there's a connection uh, very much between these, these things. And the culture of communities is very important. Uh, again, as Jay said, looking at Robert Putnam's work, we look at different communities, and, and much of what Putnam looked at was different types of communities. Uh, and if you look at typical middle class, uh, 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 suburban neighborhoods, they're very different in terms of the connectedness between people and so on. And in reverse, we see within some very poor neighborhoods some features of those neighborhoods, you might call them the culture of the neighborhoods, that can be very detrimental uh, to people's health care as well as their economic progress. The sort of the notion of contagion, that if somebody speak, if somebody smokes, if lots of people smoke, you're going to tend to smoke. If people do drugs, you're going to tend to do drugs. If people are overweight, uh, you're going to tend to be overweight. So, th so the linkage between these factors and health is very, very profound and we're learning more and more about it. And that's really what I want to talk to you uh, a little bit about this morning. And let me just start by showing you something, uh, just a graph. This is the only graph I'm going to use. 
Even though I'm from a think tank in Washington, I don't tend to use lots of graphs. But it's just one graph to show you some uh, difference between this country and uh, a lot of the other major countries uh, in the world, in the OECD and in, in Europe in particular. And if you look very closely, you'll see something, I can't see it from here, but if you look very closely, you'll see we're roughly in the middle. And you can see pretty clearly there's a difference in pattern here compared with these other countries. We see our uh, healthcare expenditures, 16, now 17% or so uh, in this country, much higher than the other countries. And we see the amount that we spend, and this is a critical point in, in many respects, the critical, uh, the, the, the amount we spend on social services, support services, housing, social services, is not only much smaller, but the proportion is, complete, is an outlier compared with all other countries. If you do a little bit of uh, very quick uh, arithmetic, you'll see that uh, in these other countries, on average, they spend uh, about $1.70 uh, on social services for every dollar that they spend on health care. We, on the other hand, spend 56 cents on other services compared with a dollar in health care. We are completely out of line with the other countries. And there's two things that come from this, I think. One is that, uh, as, as we know, that we, and as Jay said, we don't get the value for money from that expenditure on health care compared with the amount that we put into it. We don't see life expectancies that different. We don't see uh, uh, other health indicators being that much different from these other countries. But what we do see is a much lower uh, spending level on these other factors in, in people's lives, these social services. And so I think that's why I and many others, we've been looking a lot more at what people loosely call the social determinants of health. These other th expenditures or these other factors in people's lives that are really critical in understanding why their health is either good uh, or bad. Uh, and that's really what I want to, to concentrate uh, on that today. And I'm really going to sort of really look at two broad questions. Very quickly, kind of why is it difficult in this country to get a different balance between social services and, and health care. If we know that improving people's housing and uh, other social factors is important to their health, but we're an outlier and spend very little compared with others, why is it so hard as we learn more and more uh, uh, with regard to the connection between these other services and health that we don't change that balance? We seem to find it's very difficult for us to do it. And then I want to look at some possible ways forward that we might be able to do that uh, in, uh, in the future. And particularly focusing on the, on, uh, the hospital system, but not only hospitals, but the healthcare system uh, kind of generally in this country. Well, let's look first of all at these issues of the challenges. Uh, why is it difficult? And I put uh, hospitals here, but the fact is that you could look at uh, a lot of other institutions. You're gonna hear about schools, you're gonna hear about other uh, institutions today. And they all seem to share some similar reasons why it's difficult to get this balance right and to put more resources into, uh, into these services, social services or education, and a little bit less into the area of healthcare to, to begin to do this and to coordinate them. Uh, we would really want not only to get the balance changed, but we'd want to get uh, these different sectors working together very closely. But that's what I'm really focusing on right now in my work at the Brookings Institution. I have a, a project through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And the idea of it is to look at these different sectors, healthcare, education, housing, uh, other institutions in, in society, and say, how can we better get them to link together, to connect together, to achieve the common purpose of better health, better social improvement, better economic uh, improvement and so on. What do we need to do to, to, find, uh, to make that happen? And I've learned a lot from this as we've uh, looked into these uh, issues, why these difficulties arise. And let me look at, at three particular ones because these are really very similar whether you're talking about a school system trying to work more closely with the hospitals in these areas or the, the health plans to improve the health of their, of their students or if you're looking at somebody who runs a housing authority, I spoke very recently to the head of the DC Public Housing Authority uh, about all the problems that they have within uh, the housing projects and how she would like to get 
much more uh, health uh, care resources and services within that, that housing project, how, they'd like, how she'd like to improve the education and so on. And why was it so difficult uh, to do this? Well, the first main area is that we find that actually knowing what's going on with people, the, the data associated with what happens to somebody uh, through these different sectors, is really difficult in practice to accumulate and to share. If you've got a child that's got uh, problems at school, health problems, has a run-in with the juvenile justice system or some, something like that, and maybe this child has uh, ADD or some chronic uh, respiratory problem, the school nurse would like to know what's going on with this child's life. Would like to know what kind of run-ins uh, that child has had with um, the local police, for example, or what's going on in that housing. It's really difficult to get these, this data together and to share it in some way. Now, why? Well, sometimes it's just purely technical reasons. Uh, data systems are different in different areas. And getting people to actually get the data to talk to each other and the people who run that data is very, very difficult. Sometimes they just don't talk to each other. Sometimes the systems are different and so on. Also, of course, as I think we all know in the health area, there are issues associated with the law covering the ability to share information. Privacy issues, especially. You know, of course, about the HIPAA uh, uh, regulations, the difficulties and so on associated with uh, transferring data. But if you think that's bad, you know, go work in the education system because we have something called FERPA. And FERPA is even more difficult to, uh, to deal with in terms of sharing information. And often, even if people want to do this and understand the law, there's a fear, there's an uncertainty associated with sharing. People think they're going to get into trouble if they start sharing data. So it's very hard to actually get the information you need. It's also very hard for a lot of organizations to accumulate data. I worked a lot with smaller community-based organizations or with small clinics uh, in neighborhoods. And just getting the infrastructure in place to collect the, the information to actually run your operation better is a costly issue, and it's often not covered by uh, a lot of, uh, of grants and, and so on. So it, there's a lot of challenges uh, in terms of dealing with, um, with data. And it's a very important thing. We see this in every sector, as I said. The second thing that's important uh, to recognize is what I put here, I call the organizational culture and skill sets. What we're good at doing in each sector. If you're running a hospital, uh, if you're the chief medical officer or if you're uh, the administrator and so on, you've been brought up in a, in, in, in a training system designed to look at organizations like this and how they work and, and the economics of those organizations. If you've been brought up in a community-based organization, you've got a totally different set of, of skills. So getting those skills to connect is no easy task. And, and with that, it's difficult sometimes to get trust between organizations. Different experiences, different skill sets. Very hard to get people to be sure about what's involved in dealing with another partner in some way. So the organizational culture can, can pose enormous challenges in practice to getting sectors, different institutions and sectors to work together uh, effectively. And I found that more and more when I, as I've looked into this uh, area. And then the last uh, area I want to just uh, explain as being a, an enormous challenge, what I call the budget silos, the wrong pocket problem. What do we mean by that? Well, by the wrong pocket problem, we mean that sometimes the best place to fix a problem is in one sector, and that's where uh, the intensity of resources should be, and yet the benefit to it the benefit of that investment often shows up in another sector completely, completely different sector. And the first institution that is really working hard and in, in investing and putting money in so doesn't get any credit, essentially, for the value that's created elsewhere. So, for example, uh, think about a situation where, say, a school nurse in a, in a, uh, in a school uh, is working with a child uh, work with the student, working also perhaps with their parents, uh, really trying to deal with problems in the home life. Maybe there's lots of issues going on. And they devote a lot of time and, and money and expertise to this. And they make a difference in terms of what goes on with the parents and their parents' health. Then you start looking at the budget of the school system. Where's the budget item in the school system that says, 
uh, and we will cover you for this value that you create in terms of improving the health of the parents. It's, no, it's not there. It's a wrong pocket issue. The value is created over here. The cost is here. Now, when that happens, it's very difficult if you're in the organization that, in, that in, uh, has the cost to go to your financial manager and say, we ought to be doing these things. Uh, I work very closely with a hospital in uh, very close to Washington called Washington Adventist Hospital. And Washington Adventist Hospital has been doing more and more to try to deal with issues in the community. Every time they have an initiative which involves, say, hiring a community health worker or doing uh, some new project, the, the chief financial officer of the hospital sort of comes along and says, excuse me, so we're going to create uh, cost here. We're going to do all these things. And that's going to improve the health in the neighborhood. And then that's going to mean fewer people are coming to my hospital. <laughs> I, this does not compute. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very common issue. It's, it's all, so, and budgets, of course, typically don't reflect what you're really trying to do to get the, the institution that's best equipped, best skilled, to actually try to deal with this issue. So, okay, those are some of the problems. Now let's start thinking about some of the, some of the answers. What would we want to, to really do uh, uh, in this area? We'd want to try to get more and more collaboration across sectors, as I said. It's only by getting these different sectors to work together that we're likely not just to improve health, but also the uh, other results in the, in the community. I also think we ought to be thinking more about this, and I've become more and more focused on looking at the idea of hubs in communities. That there can be institutions that are the best physical place, location, in which to, to tie together different services, not just health, but dealing with social services uh, and so on. And that by doing that, it's a focal point in the community. Now, there are several such types of hubs that could exist, and I've just noted a few of them uh, here, and you'll hear about uh, some of these a bit later in the program, of course. Schools are increasingly seen in communities, I think by policymakers and by people within the community, as a very good hub, a place where people have a lot of connections to, not just students, but parents, the community, a physical building, a place in the center of the community where you could have a lot of things going on. And some of the more interesting schools in this area, and, and you're going to hear from some of those, uh, are ones that see their role in order to increase the education of the children to be to address these other issues and to look at them in more, in more detail. Uh, also, we see housing in some cases. I mentioned the, the uh, director of public housing in, in D.C. seeing, well, if people are connected in the housing area, if there's a, an actual physical area, maybe we ought to look more at how to use that housing area, that housing project, as a center, a hub, to work with other institutions in the community, the hospitals, the schools, and so on, to make that more effective. And then, of course, hospitals themselves, uh, in terms of their physical location, the fact that they've got resources, uh, the fact that they've got technical data that could, in principle, be used to, to help the data sharing in the whole community. There's lots of reasons why hospitals might be a very effective uh, uh, hub. So when we think about how could we make this happen, and, and I've put hospitals here, but you could actually think about a lot of other institutions too uh, in the same way. The first thing we've got to do is to, as, as Steve Jobs once said, think different. Uh, think about how the institution and its role uh, might be different in the future. And some, hos good, some hospital systems are really doing that. Now, there's some, some have a, a compelling purpose to look different. If you look at religious-based hospitals, if you look at uh, the Adventist system, if you look at Dignity Health out in the uh, further west, and even further west than here, uh, or the Catholic hospitals, they have a mission to deal with the broader problems of society. And, and so they have a, a mission-driven reason to be looking at that anyway. Um, so in terms of their focus, it's not, it's not a big surprise to me that we find a lot of interesting innovation in those hospitals, those mission-driven hospitals, to explore housing, healthcare, what they can do kind of within those uh, uh, areas. Um, also, if you look uh, that there are certain kinds of institutions that 
um, have a much broader uh, role generally. You, you look at uh, systems like Kaiser or uh, the Geisinger system in, in uh, Pennsylvania. In each case, they've got good business reasons uh, to think differently, to look at uh, how they might operate differently in the future uh, and bring these different services together. Because something like a Kaiser uh, system, um, you have an incentive to say, let's keep people healthy. Let's look at different ways of doing that. Let's go outside purely medical uh, areas to see what we can do. Because unlike the Washington Inventors fee-for-service system, uh, if you can get those general costs down in a system like Kaiser, that's good for the bottom line, unlike one where, that I mentioned earlier, which is exactly the opposite. And then also, secondly, thinking about um, the skills that are necessary. Um, assembling different skills within a hospital system or a, uh, a hub generally uh, is very important to bring these different services uh, together and to figure out ways uh, to do that. Uh, number one, one can look at different training. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, medical schools, uh, schools of social work, and so on. Very little has been done generally in, if somebody goes to a medical school, or even a nursing school, but certainly a medical school, uh, to really educate people in that sector about all these other factors that are important. Uh, just a few weeks ago, as you probably uh, know, uh, the uh, pediatricians in this country were encouraged to start asking certain questions of people coming in the door, particularly uh, hunger. Was a child hungry uh, in, in their background, in their, in their home? Uh, these are good questions to ask in, in terms of understanding uh, the conditions that the child is, uh, is from. Uh, we can also look at using intermediaries in, in improving the skill set. More and more hospitals and more and more institutions are looking at how can they bring in, in some way, the skills needed to go much beyond simply giving medical care, but into these other uh, areas. One approach is to use intermediaries in the, in the form of embedded, in, organ, uh, embedded organizations or institutions or people within uh, the hospital. There's an organization called Health Leads, for example, which is based in Boston. What do they do? They take basically graduate students, smart young people, embed them in hospitals. So when a, 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 um, a patient is discharged, that person says, OK, let's look at what needs you have. If it's a low-income person, how do they get enrolled in social services? How do they get help with uh, housing and so on? And these young people go on computers, because that's what they do, young people. Uh, go on and figure it all out and sign people up. So working with intermediaries can be uh, really important in that way. And there's a lot of that going on. And also things like data sharing agreements, ways of actually figuring out uh, how to share data. We're seeing more and more of that uh, happening. And then the, the final thing I want to just uh, focus on is what I call getting the, um, getting the incentives right, getting the financial incentives, and, and figuring out how best uh, to really do that. And we can do that in various ways within the hospital system in terms of in encouraging um, the resources and the, and the incentives to be correct. We're seeing a certain amount of nudging going on uh, in the sector now of encouraging hospitals in particular to invest in these areas. Uh, one is, of course, the readmission penalties that uh, hospitals face. And I know you love those of you who are in the hospital uh, sector. But what does that say? It basically says, if your patient comes back again within uh, a month, uh, we will penalize you. Well, people know about incentives, and so more and more hospitals are saying, well, what do we do to stop people coming back? And many of the things that I've seen, some of the innovations, some of the things like Washington Ventist I mentioned, I've looked at very carefully, uh, it's this impulse to avoid a penalty that has encouraged that hospital to start seeking ways of working with the community, uh, figuring out all these things. And the CFO says, we want to keep these penalties down, so they're all, he encourages them to do that. We also have... Uh, now for nonprofit hospitals, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, uh, we have the community health needs assessment that uh, hospitals have to uh, undertake. And that also encourages them to look uh, at these factors. So there are certain ways, uh, there, there are certain nudges that are increasingly prevalent in the system, particularly since the Affordable Care Act. We also can encourage uh, incentives through looking at 
enabling money to be used differently. And this is what I want to kind of end on in terms of the kind of main way of thinking about this. Part of, the, part of the major problem we have, as I said, we've got flows of money from different budgets, housing budgets, social services budgets, healthcare budgets, and within healthcare, different budgets. And, and you'd really want to mix this money up. Sometimes it's better to focus on somebody's home situation and their housing conditions than to actually give them more medical stuff, as Jay said, that just doesn't pay off. But we don't do the former. You'd really want the money to be moved around and, and to be sort of brought together and say, where is it best used? That's what you'd really want to see happening. And it's difficult to do that, but there's some hope in these areas. Um, uh, back in Washington, uh, the uh, Deloitte accounting firm has a, has a very focused project right now where it's looking, are there ways in which we can blend or braid money together more easily? How would we do this? How would we get money coming from these different uh, budgets to be blended together so we can say, what's the best way of actually dealing with this situation or this household? Um, there's been experimentation in this area. Uh, the state of uh, Maryland has a whole level of government or institutions within government called local management boards. That's at the county level. They can be government agencies or they can be nonprofit organizations. And a local management board has the power to take money from different streams and to blend it together and actually invest in a community organization or, or a, a clinic or some other institution, and they can bring it together and send it out in that way. And what is that? And the management board does a number of functions. It figures out how to uh, deal with multiple agencies. That's part of its expertise. So the organization that's on the ground doesn't have to do that, doesn't have to figure that out. It looks at if the evaluation requirements from different grants and streams of ink, and it handles that too. So that institution at that level acts as a very important, has very important functions in terms of making it possible for uh, those organizations at the, at the local level to have these different streams of income. So we're looking at a lot of ways of doing this, of, of trying to deal with the budget, um, you know, these budget silos in ways that don't try to imagine a complete restructuring of government, but closer to where they're needed to look at ways of bringing money together and letting it go out the door in different ways. That's what I think is the key to the future uh, in terms of actually making this, this happen. Well, um, some final thoughts just for a couple of minutes. And I want to tie back a little bit to what uh, Jay said at, at, at the end. We must understand and remember that healthcare is much more than simply providing medical services. I think we're all in agreement on that, as Jay said that we've somehow got to get these other institutions to come together in some way. Uh, and that's critical. We've got to think different uh, in that uh, area. And to do that, we've got to think differently about what our role is as an institution, particularly those in the medical area, and explore ways of being able to reach out into the community uh, more through the use of intermediaries, through looking at data, and how to share at that data, maybe be maybe providing services for other people in the community, other institutions, those uh, data services. We've got to think in different ways uh, in the future. Uh, and we've got to look and, uh, at the policy side, people who are in government, people who are policy makers like me, how can we redesign the way in which money flows in our system so that it can flow more effectively to those places where the real impact is going to be uh, on, on healthcare? This involves a lot of creativity in the private sector and also in the public sector, of people or those of you that are associated with government in some way. We've got to think differently in, in those areas as well. We fortunately have uh, a system of federalism in this country that does allow a lot more experimentation to occur at the local level, and we're seeing that. And things like the, um, of now the new uh, proposal, or the, the proposal, the new uh, model of accountable um, care communities and, and uh, health communities and models like this help us to, to do this. But in thinking differently that way, uh, we can do this. I think we can 
we're gradually through our federalism system, our experimentation, are, are gradually moving in this direction uh, effectively. Uh, but there'll be lots of uh, wrong steps. Uh, it's not easy stuff. And we'll get there eventually, in my mind. But let me just end uh, by saying that, uh, uh, and I think Jay kind of picked up on this, that we, we always in America get there eventually. We always seem to somehow very slowly and with a, usually at enormous cost uh, get there. Uh, but as Churchill said, uh, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else first. Um, so try lots of things, uh, and one of them will eventually pan out. Thank you very much. <laughs>